In 2022, marketing is more challenging than ever before. Companies have so many options whether they want to invest their marketing dollars into digital or traditional methods. A lot of businesses find comfort in talking to an expert who's been in the field for two or more decades. We're about to watch a podcast with Mike, the founder and CEO of Wired Island International, who's going to tell us about some of the options companies have with their marketing dollar and why why you should make a distinction between owned and earned media. Don't miss this one. I don't know if we take it for granted, but one of the things that we've noticed is it's so hard to build the owned media. Yeah. And I know that you guys a lot focus on the earned media, and I understand why, because it's a ready-made audience. You work with some pretty high caliber businesses. Do they see, how, how do they look at uh, owned media? Yeah, I mean, they see it as more and more important to reaching the target audiences that they want to reach in a more controlled way as well. Because I think with owned media, you, you obviously you're the publisher, so you control what you say versus earned media where I think there's there's definitely benefits to getting in you know, legitimate publications that have wide reach or very specialized reach, but you don't control the message as much. You're kind of beholden to whoever writes that story, which double-edged sword, that's the value they bring is that kind of filter and they're not just repeating what you tell them or, you know, spewing out marketing messages. They have a filter, they have credibility, but owned media gives you much more control, gives you much more precision and gives you much more, I feel, um, you know, accountability in terms of what are the results we're getting out of this investment in our social media, in our website, in any kind of outbound marketing that we're doing. Because ultimately, you should be able to track that to a result, whether that's more engagement on your social media, more website traffic, more conversions, more leads, more sales ultimately is what everybody's after ultimately but um, I think people are embracing the fact that they are the publisher they know more about what they do their product their service than the media that we talk to or the customers that they're talking to so package it up get it out there to the world I think the trick is how do we do that you know is it video is it is it white papers and technical documentation that's important for a lot of our customers because they sell to engineering audiences but I personally believe video is a universal format and an increasingly acceptable one for all different types of uses. I really appreciate how you talk about the difference between controlling the message and having someone um, craft a message right. because this is a conundrum that we run into a lot. And this is my selfish curiosity here. Yeah. We tell people we can build your channel. We assumed there'd be all these channel builders that we could humble ourselves, learn from. What we quickly disturbingly found out is people do not know how to build their own channels. Right. Um, and that still shocks me to this day. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult. And so what we tell people when we start with a new client is at some point, you are going to try to derail the progress that we are making with you. It yeah. happens with every client. I don't know if it's the first week or at the end of the first year, but at some point you are going to try and stop your own progress. Part of my job is to prevent you from doing that. Yeah. And the, the point at which that happens is when people want to control every aspect of their story and they completely lose the story and we had this wonderful piece of feedback from a, a customer recently and he said the problem I think is that we're looking at every frame you guys are just trying to tell a good story right. and I said you hit it on the head what, good, what do you think about that Mike like is there more value in controlling the story or having a compelling story oh I definitely think compelling story storytelling is kind of the mantra of the marketing world these days and to me it means a couple different things one it means it's interesting it's not just a black and white dissertation of what you have to offer but i think it's also it's not just about what you have to offer it puts what you have to offer in some context that resonates with people um, that people can identify with 
and it's it's more engaging. It's it's not just you beating people over the head with, hey, we're the best at this because of this X, Y, and Z. You're putting it in some context that is meaningful to them. What is their need? What is their you know hot button? Why you know what is the unique value proposition that you bring to address those needs? So, um, so yeah, I think uh, any type of content that doesn't have as its purpose to tell a bigger picture story, put what you have to offer in a context that the audience understands or that is relevant to them. Um, that's that's the challenge. I think in too many companies and I'm in tech, too many tech companies just end up believing their own stuff and regurgitating that over and over. And I'm all for consistency, but I don't think people wanna just hear you telling them how great your product is or how great your service is without putting it into some bigger picture you know, need that they have. So I, we always tell our clients, don't talk about yourself first, talk about what, what the value or the need is before you even introduce your specific solution for that problem. I could see, you know, um, don't be talking about yourself, like, you know, focus on that need. When, when we talk about need, how able are your customers to put themselves in the shoes of the people that are seeing the content? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some are better than others, um, and it depends on the type of solution they, they have. Um, I'd say on one end of the spectrum are the people, the clients that are very open-ended about and actually have something that can be much more tailored or optimized for a specific need. So they, they have a more flexible solution, let's say, versus the other end of the spectrum where I'm just selling widgets and it's the same widget that, that you, 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 everybody needs. And we just try to fit it into, um, into your buying process, regardless of what your specific need is. So. It, it's a great question because people are all over the map on that. I think, I still think even the widget guys can create a bigger picture context, a bigger picture idea of what what is the bigger issue we're trying to solve here, or what is your need before I tell you how I can solve it with this little widget. Let's talk about what you really need and put it, and I, then I can spin it. Okay, my widget is you know can specifically do this for for your requirement. So, I again I think tech companies particularly, but a lot of companies are just so wrapped up in, in admiring what their solution is without really understanding what the problem is they're trying to solve. Do they rely on you to say, here's the part of it that you're not saying? I think the value that we bring as outside consultants is we're outside. We're not living and breathing what they're doing like an employee uh, is 24 hours a day inside the office, right? So we bring that outside perspective. I call it a reality check where, where you know, yeah, that's great. You're, what you're doing is great. It's innovative, but what's the problem we're trying to solve? So we have, you know, the pro, the age old, uh, this is a solution in search of a problem is something we talk about a lot. It's like, and engineers are famous for over engineering things and, you know, adding features that aren't even needed and get in the way uh, of, you know, a practical, efficient use of something. So, you know, that goes beyond marketing. That's that's a problem with tech companies have in general, where they, they're they brilliant people working on things, oftentimes in a vacuum, right? So in general, these companies need a reality check and, you know, to gauge whether there's a real market requirement or need for it and to understand what, what the real problems out there that we're trying to solve are. That's really funny that, I mean, John Osborne said something very similar minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that outside perspective is invaluable because you're too in it, you're too immersed in it. And then the, the pieces of value you see, no customer is ever gonna understand that. Yeah. Understand it or even need it, right? You know, so that's, that's again, is it, our job is twofold. One is to position our clients so that they have relevance to the audiences they're trying to reach. And by the way, audiences can be very different, can be, you know, customers, everybody kind of gravitates to that as the primary audience. But for a lot of our clients, it's hiring. So what makes you a good place for talented people to want to work? Investors, why would someone want to invest in you? It's not necessarily that you've solved, you know, you're making the next great gizmo. It's, you know, 
well, where's the market opportunity? Is you know you could have the greatest invention since sliced bread, but if there's no need for it, then I'm not going to invest in you. So anyway, the the idea is that you tailor your your message by audience, and you also put it in a context of solving some need or 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 addressing some opportunity that's unmet out there. I love talking to people like you that have been in this. It, I mean, marketing, you'd say you're in the marketing yeah, industry. Yeah, totally. I love talking to people like you've been in the industry for decades because the the communication challenges that you struggle with are the same ones that we are struggling with yeah. at the beginning of the journey. I feel like yeah. we're all united in that. When your customers come to you, what point of the understanding are they in? What are they, what are they asking you for help with the most? Yeah, I mean, that again varies by type of customer. We have customers, clients that come to us just as they're starting or very early, early stage. And they say, we need, we need a st- messaging strategy or sometimes they don't even know that's what they need, but we tell them that's what they need. You need a way to describe yourself articulate your value, articulate what the need is that you're addressing. So that's just the foundation, we call it the messaging foundation. And believe it or not, companies at all stages need to do that periodically because things change and markets change. But so that's at one end of the spectrum. The other end is, you know, much more established companies that are, you know, just kind of rolling along and they need to either um, sometimes reposition themselves or open up a new market which could be a geographic view of the world. It could be a market sector. We have one client that has been very successful in selling into the PC market and the mobile phone market. Now they're trying to get more into automotive and trying to get more into home automation. So things like Nest doorbells and smart speakers and appliances that understand you or can, you know, literally you can talk to. So that's a whole different market. When you talk about PCs, there are four or five companies in the world that dominate the PC market. There are four or five companies in the world, in this part of the world, two companies that dominate the cell phone market, Samsung and Apple, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody buys any other kind of phone. In other parts of the world, it's different. But literally, the point is, those are very finite markets when it comes to who our guys are trying to sell to in those sectors. When it comes to home automation, there's hundreds, thousands of companies mm-hmm. making the latest little camera gas gadget or drone or you know smart speaker or appliance so it's a very different challenge because they they are not as well recognized there the market is way more fragmented so it's a different strategy that you have to take and and like i said it's a different context that they have to position themselves when they go to sell to dell or apple or samsung they're, they're a known quantity when they're trying to sell to a startup making this cool AI enabled, you know, whatever that goes into your toaster oven, you know, they don't know who our guys are. So we have to establish a, um, a whole different level of awareness for them. I mean, it seems like a, a mammoth task, but it sounds like you're very comfortable doing that. Yeah. I mean, our, one of the keys to our success and longevity is we, we, we know the sandbox we play in very well. We've been in the same industry more or less for 25 years. So we know, we know it very well. That's the, the value proposition we bring to our clients is, A, you guys have been around, you understand the challenges of selling into these types of vertical sectors in a very B2B way. We stick to our knitting. We don't try to be a consumer branding agency. We don't try to do video, which we appreciate and always recommend, but it's not something we would do ourselves. So we kind of see ourselves in some ways as a general contractor, but for a very specialized type of construction, mm-hmm. if you will, right? So, uh, you know, like I said, our, our roots are in Silicon Valley. Our expertise is all around the electronics and semiconductor space, so, which is gets a lot of attention these days because there's been so many shortages of semiconductors and a lot of talk, which has been good for us, um, not to get off track, but the appreciation for the types of companies we work for is much higher now than it was three or four years ago, just because when people couldn't get a car, couldn't get a PC, couldn't get the phone they wanted or a game they wanted because there was a supply chain issue that came back to there wasn't chips available that go into that product. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that raised the awareness for the types of clients that we work for. I feel like the whole 
world, at least our country, got a, a bit of a lesson in macroeconomics and the supply chain. Yeah. And a lot of people that I talked to, I, I guess I was surprised how many people I know were not aware of how invested we are in this global supply chain. Yeah. And then they're mad, you know, why can't I get this? Well, that comes from this country and then heads over here and then they add another thing and this mineral. Yeah. And it's amazing. Even in the business, of like I'll take one example of a client that we have. They make chips that go into same guys, chips that go into phones and PCs and games and all sorts of stuff. Their product goes, I think, touches 10 or 12 different countries before it goes to the actual end because before you buy it in the Apple store or at Walmart or wherever from Best Buy, it's gone uh, like a traveled around the world. Now most most of that stuff is going on in Asia, which is and a good part of the real important stuff is going on in Taiwan, which is why there's so much concern about China and Taiwan. And so, yeah, it's it's uh, as you said, it's become a lesson in macroeconomics. And that's just in my space, which is electronics. But, you know, the amount of stuff we import from that part of the world mm -hmm. is just, uh, you know, it's eye, eye watering. So we kind of had the double whammy of COVID, you know, shutting down the logistics of the supply chain and then these geopolitical issues with China mm -hmm. that are really unnerving from, you know, are we going to be able to do business with these guys anymore? Are they going to, are we going to not sell stuff to them? Are they going to not? And then, you know, all the saber rattling around um, Taiwan is, is just icing on the cake in terms of, you know, from our point of view as marketing and PR people, any publicity is good publicity. So it's like I said earlier, it's raised the awareness of the importance of what our, a lot of our clients do. Um, and people are much more aware of it. Hey, we're, you know, America, not to go down a whole other path, but you know, has America lost its edge? Are we outsourced too much, offshored too much? Should we bring some of that back? And there's a big movement in, in government and in the industry right now to bring more back to the United States, which talk about double-edged sword, it's a double-edged sword. You know, if you do that, prices are gonna go up because we can't do things as cheaply as you can do in China or Vietnam or the Philippines where a lot of this stuff happens. Um, but should should we, you know, so we're basically asking the consumer world to take on the, the ask to bring more jobs back to the United States. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the same things happened in cars and uh, in other industries. So um, that's a whole other discussion yeah. beyond marketing. <laughs> I it's, love framing this stuff in an economic standpoint versus a political, because political is such a rat's nest, but economic, it, it seems pretty cut and dry. It does, it does. And, you know, I'm I, a I'm believer, yeah, let's create jobs, let's do what's good for the economy. But I'm also, in this context, believe that America still should concentrate on owning the most valuable things. Mm -hmm. And that from our, where we sit in terms of our clients, it's the intellectual property and the design capability to design anything. I won't say anybody can make things because these things are very difficult to manufacture as well, but the best companies still in the world, designing chips, designing products, designing innovative tech applications, they're all American, right? If you look at, you know, on our in our world, it's Intel and Texas Instruments and AMD and Qualcomm and Nvidia. These are, there's no one that can touch these guys, mm -hmm. you know. But then if you look at the bigger picture, the Apples, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, those are all. You don't find many companies like that concentrated in one place, and that's you know kind of cliche, but that's American ingenuity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the, the, the value they're bringing is at the, the beginning, the design and the architectural stage. And yeah, okay, so Apple manufactures most of its phones in China or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the other kind of wild card is a lot of the brains that are doing the inventing are coming from other places coming mm -hmm. here, you know, a lot of a lot of Chinese, a lot of Indian, a lot of Asian and, and European um, talent coming here, which that's just the nature of America's history, right? People have always come here for a better way of life, better opportunity. And I think tech is just has embraced that, maybe too much so because uh, I think we've neglected nurturing our own educational processes that we need to keep our own population 
competitive in, in that respect. It's, Way off topic no, from, from video marketing, but <laughs> it's fascinating. I mean, we're just uncovering all this stuff. I mean, it's it's a it's a result of us being a post industrial economy. I like that you said. You know, we're we're focusing on innovation and owning these parts that are most valuable. I, I think a lot of people get lost in that. Well, why can't we make everything here? Because that is such a tiny piece of the value. Yeah. And you know, there are countries that are. I don't know if this is the right phrase, but better equipped to profit yeah, on totally. that. And then we are, I mean, we are a service based country. I mean, that's where there's a lot of money in that. And, you know, well, what if the grid goes down? Well, then we're all in trouble because right. nobody's going to watch a video on <laughs> bike power. But. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. There are places in the world that are better at or better suited for certain activities that we don't have to own the whole supply chain. I think what's become unnerving is of late is you know we lived the last several generations we lived in a pretty peaceful world right and now you know with ukraine and and china and, and things like that people are like well what happens if and covid was kind of a non-geopolitical thing but it kind of evolved into it in like hold on a sec you know if what if we can't get stuff from china anymore what if you know what if I mean, we're seeing that with the Ukraine, right? Not in terms of tech, although there's a little bit of that happening, but just in terms of food, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're having a significant impact on the supply chain of food to places that need food. Um, but anyway, the point is, I, I still don't believe it's wise to have everything in one place. I still don't believe America needs to have every piece of the supply chain, regardless of the industry here. Um, but... I do think, you know, the onus is on us to continue to be competitive in the things that matter, where the real value is. I like that. And I like focusing on the value. And so um, I, I do want to give you an extra piece of the supply chain right now. So um, I know that you said, you know, you guys, you, you focus on what you're strong at. You've been in the business for years. Um, you know where you're going to get the results. You know where you can guide your customers through. And I know that you said, on the one hand, you respect video because it's a great way to, to be compelling, to, to spread a message, to, to share this industry and what they're trying to do. And you guys don't currently do that. If you could wave a magic wand and you had a video team at your disposal, where would it be most useful for the people you're working with? Yeah, I think it, the conceptually where video would be most useful is, is ex in explaining either very technical concepts or putting our customer solutions in a context of how our customers are going to use them. So, right. So our guys tend to develop products and say, look at how great this product is. I would like video to say, look at how this customer is using this or look at this customer's need. So, you know, this customer is trying to develop a new TV that can be, can, just by you interacting with it in some visual or audio way understands what your needs are. So anyway, there's some AI needed, but so our guys would come up and say, well, let's get this great AI video processing chip. I'd rather have the customer or the customer's customer, an average person saying, wow, I can watch, you know, I, I, I one of the innovations that they're working on is being able to watch a baseball game in like, 20 minutes versus three hours because the AI can tell you, can just show you the stuff where the action is, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the, the batter, the pitcher throwing, the batter hitting, runs being scored. You want the kind of the highlight reel, but the extended highlight reel. So there's AI that can process that type of data without you even having to manually skip through it, right? So those are the types of things where I think video is rather than writing about it, I think visual content is is you know worth its weight in gold um if i look back at over what we've done over the years it's been heavily focused on non-visual content i mean i think graphics and you know still images have been part of the picture but you know partly because of the limitations of how to distribute that have it didn't exist now video because of the bandwidth and the capacity that we have in, in our networks and in our data centers you can do so much um, with very rich content, which video is obviously a rich content. And, you know, any kind of animation or, you know, visual storytelling 
it is much more accessible and distributable now than it was even 10 years ago. So I think tech companies, you know, it's, it's ironic because a lot of the tech companies we work with have a hand in enabling that infrastructure that would allow video to be distributed, but they don't use it themselves as a marketing tool, right? They're, they're, you know, they're selling to companies that use video infrastructure for some, you know, for whatever purpose, but they don't do it themselves. It is pretty ironic. It's funny. Um, but you, you've mentioned before to me that there is an interest, even though they're not currently using it. Like, what have you heard from these people? I think when people see any, any people, but in our client base, when they see a, a well done, uh, impactful piece of video content, they say, Hey, wow, that, that really works. That's, and I think their initial impression is we could do that. And then they think about it and say, no, we can't do that. We, we don't have the skills or the you know the technical infrastructure whatever is required to do that they can all tell a story i think they need coaching on you know what to say and how to use it but i think just the mechanics of taking a message and uh, implementing it in a video is i think everybody appreciates it when it's well done i just think people kind of say yeah i don't think i could do that whatever i don't i i, I think that it's becoming easier though, because, you know, I think big picture, you know, the TikTok revolution is on us, right? And everybody's doing video uh, of some sort, not everybody, but a, a, a new generation of people are realizing how accessible video is. Now, is this a good video? Maybe not, you know, just because we can do it doesn't mean we should do it, right? Um, but it, from a business to business standpoint, I think people appreciate a well produced well you know scripted video piece of content is is you know a picture is worth a thousand words a video is maybe worth a million words in some ways you know um i think i think once a video once they're on board with video or once they've kind of you know got the scent of it i think they think okay now what what do i do with that video mm -hmm. right you know i have a website i have social media i go to live events now more and more those are happening do i do webinars and things like that but you know so that's where we need help right how do i develop the channel how do i get more people looking at this um and 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 responding to it or engaging with it and and then the onus is on me to continue to feed that channel with more so that's the opportunity for guys like you and guys like us to work with guys like you to say yeah, let's, instead of just writing press releases or blog posts, let's take some of that same content and video size it, right? And, and make it more digestible and, and distribute it in different ways, so, yeah. One of the motivating factors behind us before we started the business um, was exactly what you say about building these channels. I love what you're talking about, like, you know, this potential for video to tell these stories. And the thing that kind of cracks me up is there is a bit of a disconnect, especially with big successful companies that know how to work with people like yourself, that know how to uh, manipulate the wrong word, but know how to get the best benefit from um, earned content, earned mm -hmm. media. Um, so they see smaller influencers that are successful and that are making more money than they know what to do with, you yeah. know, like these smaller channels yeah. and they want that. And then they see that this can't be done in three weeks. Yeah. And so they see the value and they also don't respect the effort that it takes to get there. Do you yeah. think that that's true? That's totally true. And I think it goes back to two things. One is video is super accessible. Anybody can make a video with their phone, right? Mm -hmm. Now, is it going to be a good video? No, but it, it's something that can be done in five minutes. But when you see a piece of well-produced, you know, edited, scripted video content that's been done by professionals, it's just, you know, head and shoulders above of the rest. And the types of companies we work with, they don't want the equivalent of a, you know, a teenage TikTok video. They need something that, that has some 
dimension to it. It has some some intricacy to it because it's a, an oftentimes a very complicated message. Now, the goal of the video should be to simplify what they're doing, but it still requires some, you know, probably some sophistication in terms of the editing and the different elements of a video. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think generally the people we deal with understand that it's not you know it's not kids play if you forgive me but um but i do think they don't have a complete because you know how many people are really in the video business they it's like you know making a movie right it's like people don't appreciate oh i could write a movie i could i could do a movie but there's a lot beyond that goes on to it as you guys know so um i think it's getting people like i said earlier i think people appreciate when they see something that's that's powerful or mm. that could work for them. I think that is just trying to, you know, get them over the hump that this is what it's going to take both time wise, resource wise, money wise, right? It's not, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And then once you have it, what are you going to do with it? And I, again, I kind of think that's, that's the what now question, right? We have just spent money and time and made a commitment to doing this video what are we going to do with it to get the biggest bang for the buck out of it? And that's, right. that's why that's why I think what you guys the way you guys are attacking it is not not just the blocking tackling of set, of doing the video. It's super important that you have the equipment and the tools and the expertise to do the production and elicit the the right content from people and make it look package it up and make it look great. But that's half the problem, right? The next half is how do I get people to look at this thing? That's right. I, I love these conversations because, you know, you talk about, you know, okay, now what, you know, mm -hmm. and so it kind of, so we have a unique perspective when we started, um, Taylor, uh, we actually, I, I had forgotten a lot of this, but believe it or not, um, in college, he showed me this channel that he was working on and I was astounded that he, he could just make these videos and get tens of thousands of people to watch. It blew my mind. Yeah. We actually looked at it last night and we were cracking up, first of all, because this is 14 years ago, so Taylor looks like a baby, you know? You know? <laughs> um, second of all, the two of us are so much skinnier than, than we are now. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can't hide in video, yeah. no secrets with video. No, you cannot. <laughs> so our first, our first video that we made together, was that the eight years ago one? Yeah, and so we went to this, um, this gaming convention, I was so embarrassed. Um, I was a terrible host, um, but yeah, we we made this video, and it was that it took us years before we actually turned this into a business. But I was astounded that one man could make this thing that thousands of people wanted to watch, wanted to yeah. view, and so his channel has continued to grow and iterate through the years. And I think if you were to ask him, "What now?" He might laugh in my face, you know, yeah. because it's like you have 10,000 subscribers. What now? We'll get more, you know, yeah. you have 20,000. What now? Get more. And especially in, you know, the age that we're in corporations, they're always looking for more profit performance of this course, quarter, yeah. next quarter. And it cracks me up that they're the ones going, what now? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Well, what, what if you guys just didn't make any more profit next quarter? Are you good yeah. with that? Yeah. What now? What you now? know. Well, there's always, and that's you know, going back to what we we're talking about, earned versus owned media. With earned media, with almost every one of our clients says, oh, "I'd love to get in the Wall Street Journal or you know, Forbes or Fortune, one of these big magazines or publications that reach millions of people." And I'd say that's great, but how many people read the New York Times? Say whatever, just say five million people read the New York Times. How many of them? Are in your target audience right versus your own media you can take a develop a piece of content and target it to exactly who you want to see it or who's mm -hmm. most likely to do business with you and you can do it very cost effectively and you can do it in a very measurable way right so i think people are realizing that when i say you know that's our mantra is you're a publisher think in terms of a publisher what does a publisher do that what they sell is their audience, right? So if you're the New York Times or, you know, Engineering Times, you have an audience that someone wants to reach and you can put a value on that. Well, you have the ability to develop your own audience or channel as you would call it. And um, 
it's a you know you can't put a value on it. It's those are the people that you define or that are self-defining as being interested in what you have to say or do or sell. That's the beauty of earned media or owned media, excuse me, and 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 the content that you can push through those channels it can be so targeted and again so measurable too. That is so perfect, Mike. I love that targeted, measurable. And that's the value of owned media. I couldn't agree more. And the thing that I tell people is, um, you know, so um, if you're putting something up in Forbes, Wall Street Journal, of course, what a win for your business. And like you said, how many of those people are your target audience? I know that you focus on um, very advanced technical B2B businesses usually. And what I tell people is with your owned media, the goal is not to build the biggest channel in the world. Because if you have a million people that don't care, how useful is that? Your goal is to build the channel of your dream customer. And I mean that, like I tell people, you know, they're like, what do you mean dream customer? Okay, let me lay out what a dream customer. They are the people that love you. They love everything that you do. They buy all your services or your top tier services and they call your customer service all the time because they're trying to learn this new feature, this new function. They are in, they care about your company. When you have an announcement, they're the first people to say, congratulations, take it to their team, share it on their pages. Yeah. And that's the beauty of owned media is you can build a channel for your fanatics. And there are fanatics that every business has now. And there are a thousand times more fanatics that don't even know yet they're desperately looking for your business and what you guys do they don't even know you exist because you're not putting the message out you're putting that exactly and you know we do it every day ourselves right we get email that we immediately delete but others that we say i can't you know not that i can't i'm waiting breathlessly for my you know walmart sale email but you know certain things that i do prioritize whether it's email or social media we're going through our social media and even if, even though we know it's someone that's ultimately trying to sell us something, mm-hmm. we kind of identify with them as, you know, we're in that community. We're in that, we're, we're, we, we, we're fans of them, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's the challenge. And that's not just a consumer thing. You know, you think, oh, that's, you know, the, the realm of Coke and Pepsi or maybe Apple and, you know, and Google and people like that. But even at a, you know, everything's at a human level at some point whether you're buying microchips for to put in your next refrigerator or you know buying McDonald's hamburgers you have to it has to resonate with someone on a human level at some point right and people become fans of your chip just as much as they are of your hamburger and you know in in some ways more so because you're making their lives easier through what you're providing them um you're solving a problem that they have right uh, so yeah i think the more companies can focus on building those channels, building those communities, building that fan base, which sounds kind of funny when you tell it to an engineering company that you need fans, but they're loyal customers or prospects at least, or people that the best advocates for you are not you yourself. It's people who have bought your product and use it and are supportive of it. So we spend time with some of our clients building communities like, you know, people who are, use their product tell us what you're doing with it right we'll we'll write about it we'll put it we'll do a video of it we haven't done that yet with some of our customers but um we have some that that would be an ideal solution like sit down for get a two minute video on this company how they used your product to solve a problem or to develop a a cool new product and what you know what was walk us through that that process and video is a great way to tell that story it, it always is, it's just so funny how we see these examples in our lives, people that are rapidly fanatical about things that seem so boring. Why would you be so excited to be an Apple customer? Why are you so excited to love your water bottle or your yeah. brand of salt or a yeah. computer chip? And if we were to pull, you know, if we were to pull up Google right now, In minutes, we could find a website where there are people ranting and raving about this chip versus this chip. I will never put this other chip in a product again. Um, This other chip, they've got me for life. And those people are out there and they they are those perfect, lifelong, loyal customers. And they will 
celebrate the wins of these companies they're yeah. fanatical about. They'll share that. They'll bring in other people that are just as fanatical. And it just, it never ceases to crack me up how we know the power of a brand. We know the power of a loyalty. And then people say, how long this is, is this going to take? Well, we have a plan. It's about a two year plan. Who well, can you get it to me in four months? Yeah. And we yeah. were just talking to John Osborne and he was talking about, you know, a, um, a venture fund. And he was saying that you got to do your research. You got to know where you're coming from. You got to know us. You got to know what you're looking for because we're talking about a five to eight year relationship minimum. minimum. And yeah. one thing that I'm often flabbergasted and trying to communicate with people is when they have these enormous goals and a very short timeline where it wants to happen. And what I've been saying lately is, no wonder you've never made any progress because you take a two year plan and you chop it down to three months yeah. and you go, what happened? Yeah. Well, nothing, nothing happened. So um, do you, when you are working with these clients that have these big goals, are you able to convey to them the importance of a prescribed plan uh, uh, the importance of a relationship that exists beyond mere months yeah I, your points are great and i think we live in this instant gratification culture right where people want to see results and success way faster and some and partly because you can in certain instances sure. right and we see these you know things go viral and inst people making you know thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight literally it seems like those are the exceptions rather than the rule. That's what, you know, we're seeing those in the press, but that's not, you know, for every one of those, there was a hundred that failed miserably or right. are struggling. I think in our world, people are much more realistic. It's, uh, the types of products and innovations, people realize, as John said, you know, it's a five, 10, even longer year proposition to get some of these products developed into market, adopted, and, you know, up the adoption curve. In particularly in certain industries, like we have companies that sell into automotive and we're they're designing products that we won't see on the road for five years, right? Be just because of the design and, and so development cycle of s types of products that, that the markets that we're selling into. So I think our, we're fortunate in that most of our clients are in that space where, you know, long cycles, long sales cycles, right? Mm -hmm. we're, people, we don't have clients that have products that you can just go onto their website and I'll take 10 of those. And, you know, these are site long, you know, six months a year to get the customer to buy in and then do prototypes and things like that. So it, the pace is different than a consumer market. And, you know, and I just think everybody gets caught, caught up in these viral sensations and fads, right. That come and go, but you know, the stuff we're working on has as long, long reach. It's a long game. For the most part and you know stuff that we're using now was worked on five years ago you know the fact that you can do a certain thing on your cell phone or you can talk to your smart speaker you know that that stuff has been under development for five or six years and or longer and it takes and it's still working out the kinks right so mm -hmm. yeah i i think we're, we're fortunate in that respect that people are i won't say patient but understand the the time frames involved with every aspect of their business, including marketing. Anything that I would say is creative mm -hmm. in any aspect, we just don't, I mean, we have people that we call on to do graphic design sure. or visual, you know, advertising is not something we normally get into, but mm -hmm. our clients are always in need of something visual. Mm -hmm. And we, we say we will do it when a lot of times we just kind of white label it with some of the contractors we had, which we would be happy to do with you guys, yeah. but we don't have any pride of ownership. We just, we want to make things as simple for the client as possible. So, I love it. you know, if they are comfortable working with us and we understand exactly or as exactly as we think we do, what they should be saying, that makes life, everybody's life a lot easier, right? Because we understand, we have enough knowledge to know what goes on on your side of the world mm -hmm. and we understand what our client's trying to accomplish. And we're, we can kind of be that intermediary and, and, you know, if our client comes to us and says, hey, we want to launch a product. Okay, well, let's look at all the different things we could do to launch that product. You know, is it a press initiative, a press tour, a press launch? Is it an event, you know, a trade show or something like that? 
you know, what about your website? What about your social media? How, what, is the, what are the assets we're gonna have to launch this product? You know, bringing in a video component to that would be awesome. Um, on an ongoing, that's kind of a one-off thing, but on an ongoing basis, like what is our strategy with social media, for example? You know, how are we gonna continue to get, grow? You've got 50,000 followers now. How do we get that to 75,000 or 100,000? We can't just keep putting the same crap up, you know, which uh, some of our clients were very guilty of doing that. Mm-hmm. And let's mix it up. Let's put some some infographics. Let's put some video stuff. Let's put some animation up. So it's getting them over the hump to one, see the value in that, which is not hard. When we point to other examples, they go, yeah, that'd be great if we could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just getting them over the hump of, OK, what? how do we get there? Right? How do we get there? Literally, with the content, with the production, the mechanics of, and and getting it out the door. So, if we can if we can say, well, we can we can do it. You know, just let's sit down and figure, let's you know kind of scope it out, and then we've got guys that can come in and and do the heavy lifting in terms of the production and the and and packaging up of what you want to say. I think we could we can sell that. You know, and yeah. it's it's just another you know, ba- thing in our bag that we we do. We do the same with SEO, right? People mm-hmm. always say, oh, I want to be on the first place page of Google. Mm-hmm. That works even as well in our favor because we say the way you do that is through content, right? That's Google right. recognizes yeah. content. That's right. So let us help you develop some content. And then we can also look at the kind of the back end of that and like what do we need to do to make a Google see us, you know, search engine optimization basically. Um, what can you do to your website or your you know, other channels that makes Google um, find you uh, more readily? So we've got people that do that for us, right? I'm not an SEO expert by any means, but I know the I know enough to be dangerous, and I know people who can actually, you know, do what needs to get done to yeah. a website and analyze a, a site. Say, okay, this is you know this is what how you should modify what how you're presenting yourself. I would love to talk about like what white labeling something for you guys yeah. would look like because one of the things that I've noticed more and more recently is um, bigger companies that can put assets into play, they have no problem getting something that looks the quality of their brand. The yeah. problem is the value. I mean, we said that a few times. Is this actually a value for my audience? Does someone even care? where they're going to pay attention and i think that's something that we excel at taylor is always putting himself in the customer's shoes and so one of the things we're going to be helping um patrick bryant with do you know um entrepreneur studio the video series Yeah. yeah so um this has all the right things in place what they desperately need help with is the packaging of it so this i mean i can get into the nitty gritty as much or not as we want. But so as I'm watching one of the videos, it's four minutes long, 10 seconds of an introduction, 30 seconds of Patrick introducing himself, all the sponsors. Most of the videos don't get into the value until the three minute mark. These videos are only four minutes long. In our nanosecond attention span world, you have to get into the value immediately. And so when we have this content, Um, What we're going to do is we're going to review the stuff and we're going to make you some videos so you can see what we could do on a shoestring budget. And then, of course, that improves with a realistic budget. Um, But we're going to give you value to where you are getting into the thing right away. Um, Like so an intro that I would say for you is, you know, um, Mike's been in the business for over 20 years. They've mastered the ability to build uh, earned media for these tech companies that often have a hard time explaining these very technical challenging concepts that engineers get other engineers get and the missing piece is the communication in between yeah. if you ever wonder how to communicate these difficult issues or how to get your business on the front page of Forbes Mike's about to tell you how to do that and like Whatever. people these days they need that yeah. quick here's the value you got to tell them what you're going to tell them tell them tell them what you told them totally I totally agree with that and, and I do think you know as much as I talked about kind of this instant gratification of the TikTok culture right <laughs> I think the other phenomenon in video which you guys is this whole master class mm-hmm. phenomenon right which is kind of related to what you guys initially explained your business to is like 
you want a plumber to be the expert on plumbing. That's, that's right. like a master class on plumbing. Right? Right. And then that that stuff and I think a lot of these a lot of people are making a lot of money off of that model, right? It's yes, like they are. you know, I'm like you said, don't be afraid to share your expertise. But if someone's gonna pay you for it, like a master class, you know, why well, yeah, I'll take your money for that. And yeah. and then and then you feel better about, you know, giving away more of your your knowledge right because you're not giving away you're selling it right the <laughs> format that we do now is purposely patterned yeah. after a master class. okay it's just so much of what they do is solid gold it yeah. looks great it's quick it's to the point it's valuable i mean it's enough of good can't be said about yeah. what they're doing